So, hi, my name is Kim Nas. I am a Chief Solutions Architect for Hitachi Vantara. Um, um, I am here to talk to you a little, about, little bit about what we are doing with regards to our own digital transformation, what we are doing in the um, uh, in the space, and what we want to uh, what we want to achieve uh, going forward, and also how we can apply this to help our customers. So, um, with that, um, let me uh, take you on a little uh, journey because when Hitachi decided to contact me and they wanted to hire me, I was like. Well, hi, isn't that like hi-fi systems and stuff? And I didn't really know the breadth of what Hitachi can bring and what the breadth of what Hitachi were doing. So that Hitachi were 800 companies, that wasn't something I knew until I actually started working here. Um, and today I see the enormous um, advantages we have of bringing operational technology and uh, information technology together for bringing, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, a train uh, filled with thousands of sensors, which I will explain to you a little bit closer afterwards, um, and how we build that and how we predict the maintenance of it and how we can build a more reliable train service in the UK. Um, on a personal side, I'm very interested in robotics um, and I'm a huge fan of Tesla and SpaceX and Elon Musk. And very happy to say that uh, Hitachi are also investing and also developed robotics and we're also developed and are delivering systems to autonomous driving and autonomous cars. So, um, back in the days um, when we used to work with business intelligence, um, we used to work with ERP systems, we used to work with the CRM systems, we used to create a data warehouse and, uh, uh, and we used to create our star schemas, we used to creating our beautiful visualizations uh, and whatnot. And that was all well and good, but you were only working for the majority of the time with, with um, transactional data and uh, financial data. And to a certain extent, that is fun. I have to say it's a lot more interesting when you actually start working and, and, and can feed um, uh, a system with data from sensors, from, from machines, from humans, um, you name it. But with the explosion of data coming from sensors, machines, humans, etc., uh, we need to start thinking about a transition from BI to AI, because a lot of that can't happen unless you have some kind of mathematical algorithm trying to crunch the numbers for you, so you can get uh, answers uh, a lot faster than you could if you were applying more of a manual BI operation. Um, with that said, uh, I think still a lot of the work that's being done in this space, it comes down to data and how you are being presented with, a, in this case, a lot of data that looks like a mess, a big mess. Uh, either if you're trying to create uh, a data lake and you're trying to create it and you're, you're filling the data lake with a lot of different data from a lot of different sources in a lot of different formats, it doesn't look good. So, especially for me, and being a person who has a slight OCD, uh, one of the first things you start doing is you just want to start sorting that data to try to make a sense of it. And I still we think we still do this. We still need to do this. Um, and the next step, you want to arrange that data, and finally, you want to start presenting them visually. Um, I used to do this as a kid. Uh, it was actually fun. It was it was. Uh, um, part, of, part of my growing up and being able to work with it today is, is a lot, um, uh, brings me a lot of fond memories. But maybe the most uh, enjoyable is actually just taking all of that Legos, all of that data and throw it around, play it, play it with it with your data scientists, try to make a meaning uh, of the data and try to uh, see if your um, machine learning algorithms, uh, your, your deep learning, um, whatever you're utilizing, can start uh, crunching that data and start giving you some answers. Or you can just train your models into whatever direction you want to go. But in the essence, what you're, what, what you're trying to do is you want to, you want to start um, creating some kind of system in the chaos that you're having, and you want to automate it. So uh, with that said, um, I, I just want to reiterate, I think 
Um, I think I mentioned it, Hitachi already have about 800 companies. Uh, in total, I, uh, I believe that Hitachi has 190 manufacturing sites uh, all over the globe. And um, at every and each and every one of these examples, as you see here in, um, in, in the slide, all of them, we have implemented AI or machine learning um, over a thousand times in a lot of different use cases at industrial scale already. So most likely we are doing it and we're doing it at your industry or your vertical. So we will have some kind of insight into or some kind of experience as to how it's being done. Um, we, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the, um, the key use case, perhaps. Um, I, will, I will be discussing three use cases, but we'll start off with an Hitachi one. So this is about four years ago, four or five years ago, and Hitachi Rail um, felt that they wanted to move into the oldest train market in the world, United Kingdom. And anyone who's seen the uh, the layout and the and the operations of the of the trains in the UK knows that it's very very complex. Um, their goal, their business challenges, was they wanted to modernize and improve rail transportation reliability. They wanted to reduce uh, maintenance costs, and they wanted to utilize technology to uh, find these answers. Uh, one of the goals that they set about was to be able to deliver trains as a service. Many of you are utilizing as a service models already, and uh, I'm pretty sure that um, whatever as a service model you're utilizing, it's not as expensive uh, to set up as this one. Uh, this is talking millions and millions uh, of pounds per train, per train set, and we are uh, scaling up to um, to 300 train sets um, during the during this contract for Great Western Railway and for Virgin Atlantic, a uh, Virgin Railway. Um, now, first first things, um, each and every train are fitted with three to three thousand five hundred different sensors that. Um, measure um, some kind of, uh, of, of a device on the train and feedback data uh, back into the system. Um, what we uh, very early started to see was that um, for, to build this solution, we really needed our data scientists to work closely with the domain experts. So we could bring in data scientists from the technology uh, who would know how to build up the mathematical um, the machine learning models um, but we really needed the domain experts to identify the data, to train those models. And we really needed the domain experts to tell us what are the, uh, the mean values here? What is bad and what is good? And where do we want to be? Do we want to be in the middle? Do we want to be high? Do we want to be low? Um, and getting all of that insight, it takes time. Uh, so, and we needed to do this for a lot of different instances from a lot of different sensors. So, getting up to a certain um, level of predictability into your model and the uh, ability it has to predict um, failures, for instance, in some of your equipments, that's going to be very critical. It can be very time consuming. So we were applying the model on new sensor data to, for, to estimate the probability of, of all kinds of different failure types. And then we had the ability to control the trade-off between recall and a false alarm to minimize overall maintenance cost. Um, the architecture that we uh, used to build this um, was that whenever the trains were operating, um, as you can see um, in the middle of the picture, uh, we had um, the trains fitted with 3G and 4G uh, transmitters so that they could send data as they were traveling. Uh, we also uh, had data dumps uh, happen at certain junctions or certain um, uh, stops and at service intervals, of course, where they could offload more data and do it more freely. Uh, this data uh, was usually picked up by um, Hitachi's software for data integration, Pensaho. Um, we were utilizing different um, uh, IoT streams uh, in order for us to, to do this. 
um, and utilizing some uh, data ingestion um, ETL procedures. So we could uh, input some raw data directly into, um, into Hadoop. And we could also uh, utilize uh, Pantao uh, to build it in, uh, in MapReduce and then feed it back into time series event database for Apache HBase and analytical database um, uh, for Cloudera. Uh, we were also with Pantao able to orchestrate data streams of Kafka and, and Spark. Now, all of this was then used to visualize uh, in the analytical layer, to visualize the data um, so that we could build um, uh, ex uh, reports and dashboards for the different um, uh, roles within uh, Hitachi Rail uh, and Great Western Rail and, and Virgin Atlantic. And we were also utilizing a lot of the data that was being fed from the um, uh, uh, the trains and their sensors to build a rule engine to do fault prognostics and event detection. Um, of course, also doing those uh, with statistics and machine learning. So all of this then led into us being able to do um, what you can see at, a, at, at uh, the last um, section at the presentation layer. So we were able to use this data and use this visualization to do maintenance planning, um, event definition processors, uh, having dashboard and reports ready for management and, and for train operators, uh, having a system admin up and ready, and a um, definition editor for the events. Uh, for the rule engines, we were able to build real-time alerting, uh, a fault di diagnosis, and a trend analysis, um, in, a, in addition to real-time monitoring uh, of the data that was being sent while the train was moving. Um, <clears throat> So the key outcomes uh, of this was that, uh, of course, Hitachi was now able to avoid unexpected failures. We are uh, paid uh, for having the trains operating at an SLI per month, uh, SLA per month. So if the, uh, if the trains were not operating, in essence, we, were not get, we would not get paid. So we were avoiding unexpected failures. We increased the availability of the equipment, uh, avoided service interruptions, and accumulated um, over 20 million year, uh, pounds of savings in maintenance costs annually by adopting a digital uh, um, service model and a prediction model for, uh, for, for those trains. Uh, we were also to do, uh, able to do accurate estimation of performance degradation using AI and ML uh, to reduce those unplanned downtimes. Down um, might not be too surprising, uh, but I can disclose that the uh, the two most common um, failures or breaks um, uh, that caused interruptions on the trains uh, were the train doors and the brakes. So we, um, uh, of course, tried to have mitigating reasons for that, uh, but still those are two of the main ones. Not a big surprise, but it's, uh, it's good to get that uh, knowledge out, out there. Um, this is a this is a story from a Scandinavian use case. It's Stena Line, uh, who are operating ferries um, in the uh, in the um, between Sweden and uh, Germany, Finland and uh, Denmark. And uh, in the beginning, they um, were discussing with us how to do route planning optimization, and that can be um, varying on a lot of different um, variables. So uh, up, to the, up to the right, you can see a lot of the different possible data sources that we were feeding uh, the AI model with uh, in order for them to train um, an AI captain, if you want. Uh, that's what they referred to it. So they were not doing this uh, in order to replace the captain or to have autonomous ships, but they really wanted to uh, have an AI engine being trained by the most experienced uh, captains of Stenaline uh, on how they were operating the vessel in different uh, winds, currents, and depths uh, to be more fuel uh, efficient and, uh, and of course, have a safe navigation um, for, for, the, for the passengers and a safe journey. Um, when they were able to train that uh, AI and that AI captain, their newer captains who were just being promoted to captain or hired as a captain, they could have that experience from all of their most experienced captains right next to them 
telling them um, on optimal routes navigating both the uh, the waters, um, the, uh, the the winds, and for um, for for predictive maintenance as well. Um, and as uh, as um, Stanaline themselves said, planning a trip and handling a vessel in a safe and at the same time fuel efficient way is craftsmanship. Practice makes perfect, but when assisted by an AI, a new captain or officer could learn how to fuel optimize quicker. Uh, <clears throat> now, I also wanted to show you and talk to you a little bit about how data is agnostic and how we can utilize data uh, across different industries. So we are taking our practice on how we have um, built a digital transformation journey for, for, for instance, our own um, manufacturing plants uh, for Hitachi Rail, for a lot of different um, uh, internal companies, but we are of course building it for clients as well. Uh, I love this use case. Um, and this is uh, a story about Cenimax, uh, a gaming studio in the US, um, and a gaming studio that owns a lot of different game titles. Uh, one of them being the one you see here, uh, Doom, one of my old favorites from when I was uh, um, in, 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 uh, in middle school and in high school. Um, and they had uh, challenges. Cinemax were, were having five different game studios who all had five, uh, different game titles. Um, and that meant that they had data silos. That means that they had issues with regards to the format that the, the data that was being outputted from the from different game developers uh, on the game uh, and the gaming behavior themselves. Uh, we're in different formats, everything from, from databases and data warehouses to, to JSON files and, uh, and other. Um, and they were also in different entities as well. Um, they were also having issues with regards to data integration. Uh, they were doing a lot of manual scripting and it wasn't um, being optimal in the way that they were being, that they weren't, they weren't able to onboard new sources or new data fast enough. Uh, the data architecture definitely were not helping them at all. Uh, as they were currently at, uh, as a, um, at an on-premise um, uh, model and the data volume, because it was uh, exploding, especially as they started utilizing um, more and more uh, data services um, uh, and starting to creating massive multi online role-playing games. Um, so what they started to do um, was that they needed to start analyzing data and they needed to start analyzing data a lot faster. They needed answers to questions like, are certain battles too difficult or too easy? When they were analyzing gameplay in a massive multi online role playing game, they needed to understand this and they needed to understand it maybe not, not in real time, but at least when the player were logging off and sending data back to the servers, they needed to understand how the, how the player were performing. So how quickly do the players return after they log off? Um, what battles or missions do gamers prefer or seek out? Do they have any favorites? So can we present them with something? Can we create a, a Netflix viewer recommendation um, look and feel uh, of when the, when the gamers get back into the game? So will it, be, will it be set on that quest or another quest and be tossed against that uh, monster or another one? It's going to be based on your preferences and, the, and perhaps the demographic of other people who are enjoying the same ones as you are so that we can keep players happy and keep players engaged. But we also need to stop thinking about, so if, if, they are, um, if there are particular points in the game when the players tend to abandon ship, uh, when do they start to really uh, quit logging back into the system so that we can't um, uh, keep them on a recurring subscription model uh, paying per month? Um, and can we also try to understand the characteristics of the players who sign up for multiple Cinemax titles? Can we then, uh, can we then um, uh, recommend them new titles and things that we would expect them to like and perhaps give them sneak previews? Um, so the solution. So you see here the game studios. They had Tango Software, Arcane, uh, Bethesda, uh, ID Software, and Machine Games. A lot of different um, and, and pretty famous titles here, both Wolfenstein, um, you had uh, um, Doom, of course, you have uh, uh, Elder Scrolls and more. And their vision was to improve customer loyalty and analyze how customers play their games. 
Now, first off, they started to, to see that the amount of data that they were generating uh, was huge. Uh, it's up to five terabytes per day. And that's actually a, a, an old number so that has grown. And they're utilizing Batao data integration to actually feed or, or, um, or crunch through all that data, uh, connect to it, and then send it off into the data lake, which today um, is on Amazon. Um, and they utilize the SR and uh, S3, sorry, and uh, Redshift. They are then utilizing Pentao's um, ETL capabilities to build an analytical database, uh, but also to expose um, the data lake to the, uh, to the data scientists who wanted to, to understand the, um, uh, the data in the, um, uh, and the questions that were being asked in the previous, um, the previous slide. Uh, and then as a front-end visualization, they were utilizing Pentao's uh, visualization capabilities. And of course, also uh, feeding Tableau um, for, uh, for self-service uh, reporting. Um, if you look more deep dive into the, uh, into the architecture, uh, you can see that the, um, uh, the eight AWS components um, are, uh, are plenty. Um, their technical strategy was to build this with Redshift, uh, Databricks, um, uh, Cloudera, uh, Oracle, and Pentao. And P PDI or Pentao, it gets the data from the Oracle databases or the, from the flash files. Um, and PDI then aggregates the data and creates S3 files. It puts it then into Redshift via a copy command and analysis is performed against Redshift. Uh, we were also utilizing some of our uh, adaptive execution uh, engine, who enables Pentao to actually orchestrate uh, Spark jobs, uh, which was then uh, pretty um, uh, useful for them. So this enabled them to say that, well, every sword that's swung, uh, axe that's thrown, and spell that's cast, and dragon that's slain, is recorded and analyzed as developers seek the perfect balance of challenge and triumph to keep players engaged for years. And in the end, uh, the, the outcomes were that they were able to say that we are, we are able to have a better analysis uh, of the data. Uh, we are able to analyze up to 10 times more data from gaming behavior than what they were able to do previously. Uh, and also allowing their analysts to spend more time studying gaming behavior, studying gaming behavior instead of uh, loading data. And it also reduces time needed to launch new products from months to weeks. Uh, they were also able to do more automation, uh, automates work that had previously been done manually or with Python scripts. Um, it also enabled greater efficiency with regards to having better quality of data and one consolidated view across their different gaming titles uh, and gaming studios. Um, and for internal procedures, this also read in, a, in an increased productivity for insights into billing and accounting. Um, so I, I said that also that I wanted to, to discuss a little bit about how we are actually... <coughs> Sorry about that. So how we are approaching um, some of the projects that we are um, tasked with either internally within Itachi or externally when working with clients. So we like to take our customers on a data journey, obviously, but we do see that on that data journey, there's a lot of different obstacles. There's a, there's a, a huge growth of data complexity um, and the, both, both with regards to data being on the edge, on premise, in different clouds, uh, in different formats, in different databases, uh, you name it. All of this creates major challenges, especially if you wanted to, to, to bring a data ops practice where you want to automate the, the data pipelines as much as possible. So first and foremost, we see that there's a, a big skills gap with big data tools. Uh, a lot of the early big data projects um, where you were building Cloudera, uh, Hadoop, um, Hortonworks environments on premise. Uh, and a lot of the times IT gave that job to either database administrators or storage administrators. And the big uh, failure there was that neither um, the storage admin or the database admin were usually very uh, proficient with Java, which is really a, a, a requirement uh, when working with big data. Also, it's still a heavy IT involvement. Um, and uh, 
there are a lot of different things that needs to happen and IT being involved in. And IT can then sometimes be seen as a bottleneck because IT wants to have their uh, processes done and ready. And um, having that um, agile way of working uh, isn't always too easy. Uh, the data explosion, I think I mentioned that. Uh, there's still a lot of unstructured data and the ability to actually get all that data uh, and start analyzing that and, and, or, or more or less just arranging them and sorting them uh, before you can analyze them, that's hard. Uh, and you need to start thinking um, um, big in order to, to succeed with this. Uh, there's an 80% rule. Data prep is still 80% of an analytics project. That's, that shouldn't be the, the case. That should be 10 to 20%, especially if you set up a data practice, data ops practice. Uh, cloud are sometimes creating data silos as well. Uh, we've seen statistics saying that you have up to five clouds per organization. And in the end, deploying machine learning models can be hard. And you don't always have an automated process for updating the models when you put them into production so that you can train them and retrain them uh, on new data. So what we are trying to do is that we are trying to take our, our customers on a journey on a digital transformation journey. Um, we are helping them enabling digital experiences. And in this time of year that we are in now and the, uh, in the year of the pandemic, uh, we see that a lot of different companies are scrambling to, to give digital experiences uh, on a lot of different levels to their, to, their, uh, to, their, um, to their clients. And the ones who succeed are the ones who will grow. And the ones who are lagging behind, they have challenges. Uh, we are helping them drive operations um, excellence. We are helping them modernize the digital core. And all of this is needed to become a data-driven organization because it can't really be done uh, unless you start having data and having data that can answer the questions in your organization. Now, this enables digital acceleration, uh, innovation, sorry. This accelerates digital innovation. Um, and it can then help them define their strategy. It can link technology to outcomes. It can augment their existing resources with business architecture planning, digital centers of excellence, data science, and product engineering services, and more. <coughs> Sorry about that. So both internally and to our clients, we are delivering this through Hitachi's Lumata software. It's all data, it's any industry, it's any cloud, and it's every innovation. We are here to, to help both uh, our own companies and our clients succeed in any way we can. <coughs> I think you can have some. Yeah. Okay, I don't have COVID. Uh, it's just my asthma that sometimes um, picks up. So my fi my final two slides are, are are here. So first off, start thinking about leveraging data as an enterprise asset. Uh, start thinking about data monetization and try to have a plan uh, for data governance to both um, find uh, leverage all of the data that you have in your organization. Uh, then try to understand what kind of assets, assets you, are, uh, you have through a standardization, retention, administration, monitoring, and communication of knowledge. Um, this increases the information integrity, confidence, confidence, and reliability while enabling a common business acumen. Now in Hitachi, we are doing this, and we're doing this internally and externally. First off, we start with creating a, an initial roadmap with our customers. Uh, we build scrum teams that create uh, epics and user stories to fill the backlog and then we put this into a development practice where we plan design develop test and put it in a demo and then we release to production uh, and during that production we have a testing phase as well um, and then it's sent to final production and hopefully as a minimum viable product we can reiterate that cycle and we can create that service better and better over time so with that said, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, this is our full Lumada data management portfolio. Um, and my final say is that um, we are powering good. 
uh, one of the missions of Itachi is to drive social, economic, and environmental value. Uh, so what can we do and what can't we do together? So with that, um, I'm gonna say thank you and hand it over to Lena.